so, so good to see so many friends. Hard to believe uh, 11 years ago uh, when Susie and I had the opportunity to plant this great campus out here in Washington Township to see what the Lord has done and, uh, again, see so many familiar faces, so many new faces. We love that. Pastor Pat, come up here for a minute. Uh, this is Who Wears It Better? Come on. Let's, uh, <coughs> who Wears It Better? <laughs> he has a better metabolism than I do, so that, you got to take that into granted. You know, we're, we're neighbors. You guys know we're neighbors, right? And so we walked out of the house today, got our bags on. We started walking down the driveways. And went, no, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. But we did show up here today, and we did go, you look good. You look good. You look good. We did, we did do that. Love you, buddy. Hey, these guys are doing such a great job as our campus pastors here. Love you and Alyssa. So proud of you. You have, you have wonderful style, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's going for you. <laughs> Man, I, I'm really excited to just share with you. Uh, I think just the word of the Lord is going to encourage us here today. As we look into this sermon series, we're just talking about uh, giving the better gifts of Christmas. I really believe with all my heart there's better things for us to give. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe this is Christmas week, huh? And uh, in my house this week, we, we call this Bedlam, Bedlam week which means the adrenaline is going to be on overload. Our whole goal will be to, like, calm. You know, three boys, 12, 9, 5, you're going to be 6 here in a few minutes. We have 17 advents around the house where they have to hang up different things on different days. And I love you, Susie, but it gets a little crazy. And whose day is it? And they're fighting over Santa Claus. And, like, why well, don't want you put Jesus up? I want Santa Claus. You know, it's like, but we work our way through it all. And uh, it will be trying to calm everybody down this week, get them to bed early. And then uh, if you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're going to give gifts. We love giving gifts. But I believe in this Christmas season there's better gifts to, to give. Last week across our campuses, we, we talked to, uh, about how much we have to, have to allow the Lord to move in our heart, to really move from get to give. It's a transition uh, that we have to have in our heart. And we talked about how can we wrap up better gifts this Christmas season we can wrap up the power of God wrapped in, in prayers. Amen? And, and, and we can wrap up uh, the love of God, and we wrap it up in serving. And, and we, can give, we can give healing wrapped up in words. And those are the better gifts that we can give. I'll share you a story uh, that just happened to me just last week that I think kind of shows how this works um, a little bit. If you, were, if, if you were at Wyckoff or online last week, you heard me kind of close the message with this thought. Uh, last Saturday night, uh, I was flying back in from Arizona, <clears throat> had a trip out to Arizona, and we had a, I had a late, late flight come in, and I didn't get picked up to about 10.30, and of course, my brain's like, man, <laughs> you know, that 8.30 service is coming quick. I get up really early on Sundays to study, get my last final thoughts ready, get my heart prepared for the, for the day, and so we had a new driver come pick us up, and his name is Danny, and so I just started talking to Danny and learning about him, and we had about, you know, about 45-minute drive up to the house, and it's getting later and later, and so I say, hey, Danny, are you married? You, you know, what's, what's going on with you? He goes, yeah, actually, I, I'm married, and um, just two years ago, uh, I, I got married. I said, well, congratulations, newlyweds, that's wonderful, and he goes, actually, my wife, she's down in Virginia right now, and I said, well, that's great, you know, I'm just trying to build a friendship and build a relationship. I said, well, my wife is from Virginia as well. We go down several times a year, and I go, Where, where's your wife from? She goes, well, well, Richmond. I said, that's great. We go through Richmond all the time. That's like our normal thing. I know, I know the area very well. And he goes, but actually, uh, it's, a, it's a tough week. My, my wife went down there. Uh, her sister tragically died in a car accident this last week. And of course, I'm just trying to be friendly and make a new friend. And all of a sudden, it gets really serious really quickly. <clears throat> I said, Tanny, I, am, I, I just want to tell you, I am, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. And I asked, you know, what's your, what's your wife's family's name? And he says, the Simmons family. And I said, I'm going to be praying, you know, for, for your family. And we talked a little bit more. And then when we pulled into my driveway, and again, it's probably at this point around 11.30, 11.45, I don't know. I'm, my brain's more on going to bed. <laughs> and I said, hey, Danny, I'd like to do something. I don't know where you're at in faith, uh, but I have two things I want to do. <clears throat> First thing is I have, I have a couple of good friends that pastor in, in Richmond. If you guys need anything, this week, all you have to do is let me know. I'll call down. I'm going to send you two churches. I'm going to send you their information as soon as we, we're done here. And if you need anything down there, you let me know. I'll call. I'm telling you that they'll reach out to you. They'll do whatever you need. 
The second thing I'd like to do is I'd just like to pray with you. Would you be okay if I just prayed with you? And of course he said, of course. And so I, I just said, I, I, can I just lay my hand on your shoulder? He said, of course. And so here it is, 11.45 at night in my driveway, and I just said, Danny, I'm going to pray that the power of God would come and just bring healing to your heart, your wife's heart, your family. I know it's going to be a difficult season, a difficult week, but God can restore. He can do something. And so I didn't have the perfect words to say, but I believe that the words of the Lord came through. And I believe with all my heart that this Christmas season was able to give a better gift uh, through prayer and showing really the love of God through prayer and, and show healing through our words. The, the Proverbs says that our tongues have the ability to, bring, to speak life and death. And uh, even though they're dealing with death, we can bring life out of those things. And so here's my words of encouragement to us during this Christmas season. I don't want this to just be a sermon series. I want this to be something that sinks deep into our hearts and our spirits, that there's better gifts to give. They're not just about Christmas time. They're all year round, that we are the church mobilized. Amen? And sometimes we think, oh, how do we have to do this? You just have to have the love of Christ in you. Look for opportunities to minister to people, and you'll watch the Lord open tremendous doors for you. Amen? Amen. So, so that's how we do it. Today what I want to talk to you about is, is similar. We're talking about giving better gifts. And, and, I, and I want to talk to you uh, about giving better gifts. And, and we talked a little bit last week of kind of what we can give. Today we're going to kind of look at more who. Who are the people that we can give this to? And we're going to look at, at, at God's kindness. I want you to write that down. How do we give God's kindness away? Um, I would just say this. It's much, it's much easier to say than to do oftentimes, right? Jesus says what? Love the Lord your God, your, all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, for some of us, some neighbors are easier to love than others, right? Uh, I told you, Pat and I, we're, we're neighbors, but there is a house in between us, and we have a great neighbor, Steve and Michelle. They live between us, and I can just let my boys run wild because Michelle's always looking out the window. Uh, matter of fact, sometimes she brings them back home and says, hey, JP just showed up at our house, and do you want him over here? And so they're, they're great, and they're easy to love. They really are. They're just easy to show love to and, and be with them. And then we have, we have, do you have, do you have other neighbors? You know what I'm talking about? We have a neighbor that walks their dog, except for it's not a dog, it's a bear. You know what I mean? There's a, he walks in, there's a dog, and I'm like, that's not a dog, that's a bear. It's like, you know, down the street. And they, those neighbors, they're tough to love. Like, you know, you, everybody thinks their dog is the best. You know, oh, no, they're kind. They're just playing with you. Like, no, you're, you, he's biting me. <laughs> Your dog is chewing off my ankle right now. He's not kind. He's not loving. He's not playing. He's chewing my leg. Like, you know, so some neighbors, you know, if you have one of those neighbors and they're like walking and they're like, there's their bear dog. And they're like, come on over. I'm like, no way. Like that thing's going to eat me. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's got claws on it, not paws. You know, I'm like, I'm staying away from that. So we have these neighbors. Some of these neighbors are easy to love. And then sometimes we have some neighbors that are hard, but, but God calls us to love them all and to show God's kindness. And in this season, as we talk about the better gifts to give Part of what we're going to give is we're going to give kindness, and we're going to give God's kindness to, to, to all. We're going to talk about uh, a guy named M Mephibosheth, and you're going to find his story in 2 Samuel, and uh, it, it's an incredible story about God's kindness, and, and we're going to look at how this does this. And here's what I want to talk to you about kindness, and specifically God's kindness. God's kindness has the, the power to shift our limited perspective. That we, th we see things in the natural, but there's things taking place in the supernatural that we can never imagine. God's kindness, it can free the load that many of you are even carrying in today. I, I believe that God's kindness can change the way that we see people and, that we, and how we interact with people. And I believe it leads to a place of being able to truly love people. I'm going to give you this statement. I want you to write this down. If it's the only thing you take from today then you're in a really, really good place. It's just this kindness solves problems better than anger does. Amen? Amen. Man, I just believe that kindness solves problems better than, than anger. And, you know, we think, how many know the world's got some problems? And I think that they're real. I think they're the real deal. And, and I believe that the way the church is going to navigate our way through this season, this culture, 
is not through anger. Um, it's not through four pages worth of typing in a message chat. Um, it's going to be through kindness because kindness is really what's going to turn the table um, and not anger. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about. We're talking about the better gifts of Christmas, that there's things that we can give. And I believe that we can show God's kindness really to, to, to all. And that's what we're called to do. There's a story in the Old Testament we're going to look at. And it kind of revolves around uh, this guy, King David. If you don't know who King David is, he's got a very famous movie that came out not too long ago. David defeats Goliath. You know that one, right? The kids love that one because he chops his head off at the end. They're like, chop the head off. And I got boys. So anyway, so David, uh, we, he has this. And so here's the deal. So he goes, he kills Goliath. And then there's a king, King Saul. And King Saul gets super jealous of David because he now has like the acclaim of Israel, right? And they're like, they come into town and they're like, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. And they're like, you're like, and Saul's like, what's up with that? And so he gets really mad and he's like, I'm killing him. I'm taking him down. Here's the, here's the, here's the thing though. Saul's son, Jonathan, is best friends with David. So they're like in the basement playing Nintendo, and like dad's upstairs, he's like, I'm going to kill him. And so Jonathan, has, so Jonathan actually warns David and says, you got to get out of here. You got to run because my dad is out to get you. And so he flees. That's awkward, right? Like, hey, I know we're best friends, but my dad, he's coming to get you. And he's like, he's not mad. He's going to kill you. So run for your life. And so this all happens. And then finally he's running, he's avoiding him. And then one day David gets the news that both King Saul and, uh, and Jonathan die in battle. And at this point, they come and they bring David, and he becomes the king of Israel. This is kind of how this works. And so we're going to pick up the story, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Um, and it just simply says this. It says, one day David asked. He asked a question. Questions are good to ask. Do you know that? You should ask yourself a lot of questions. He says, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Okay, now let me help you with this a little bit. If you're a new king... And in ancient history, whenever a new dynasty or a new family took over, this is what took place instantly. Kill everybody else from that other family so that they don't rise up against us. We are now in charge. And so when David's men hear him say, hey, is there anyone still alive in Saul's family? They think if there is, don't worry, we're going to get him. And David's men were loyal. David one day says, man, I could use a drink of water. They're like, we'll get you a drink of water in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem's surrounded by the Philistines, and they're like, no problem. And they go into enemy territory to get him a glass of water, and he brings it. And he's like, what are you doing? And he pours it out. And I'd be like, that's wrong. You know, we did this. But he pours it out, and they go, no problem. Is there another glass of water? This is how loyal they were. They would go in and get a cup of water with the Philistines surrounding it. They would do anything. So they hear these words, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? And they're like, yes. And then he switches, and he goes this. Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. The story switches immediately. We're thinking revenge. We're thinking death. And David is thinking about kindness. I love this Hebrew word for, for kindness. It, it, it's the word kesed. And it's like the, it's the, the word we would know in the Greek is the word like agape. It's a different kind of love. It's a God-sized love. It's it's unconditional, it's unmerited, it's unwarranted, it's a ridiculous type of love. That's the kind of love he's trying to show. So he says this, he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked, now this guy's probably scared, like why are you calling me in? Because again, remember, they all, they're all thinking death. Yes, sir, I am Ziba, replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, catch this line. I want to show God's kindness to them. Not my kindness, not David's kindness, not Israel's kindness. Is there anyone still alive in his family? Because I want to show God's kindness in this situation. And so he's going to show him a different type of kindness. And he says, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled. In both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodebar. Ziba told him at the, at the home of Machir, son of Amil. And so there's this, fa there's this very like theme that goes through this. And it's the physical condition uh, 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 of this man. And Mephibosheth 
is crippled. And this is the story that goes through the whole thing. And here's the thing is, I won't read the story, I'll put it on the scripture, but he wasn't always crippled. When Jonathan and Saul died, everybody knew we better flee for our life because you know that your reign's over. And so a nurse went and picked him up and as they're running, she drops him and he breaks his legs and he's crippled. And so this is how this takes place. And so it kind of starts the story off. And so because Saul and Jonathan died, and so I think about this like this, man, have, have any of you ever had like this kind of moment? Like it, it, it's, it's in this thing where like all of a sudden everything in your life gets turned upside down. This is what's taking place in Mephibosheth's life. He is, all of a sudden, he's this boy, and he gets turned around. And I mean, have you ever gotten that phone call? And you realized, oh, everything's just changed. Oh. I, I, I think about Danny when he got the call. My sister-in-law just died in the car. Something just tra traumatic happens in, in this thing, and, and the dreams begin to change and taken out from, from under you. Uh, Mephibosheth says his name actually means this. It means son of shame. And so he carried this around him. So he goes into like the witness protection plan, which is like far, and it's this little town called Lo Debar. And this is where people go to not be found. It's like the backwoods. It's like the wilderness. It's like modern day Pennsylvania. You know what I'm talking about? Like <laughs> could go there and just like escape forever. That, that's basically where he's going to. It's far away from Jerusalem. It's far away from the king. It's far away from the place of peace. It's far away from the place of worship as he goes away from Jerusalem. Maybe today you walk in and that's how you feel. You feel far away from peace. You feel far away from worship. You feel far away from God. Or maybe you know somebody that's going through something today. As we talk about the better gifts of Christmas and God's kindness, I want to tell you that God wants to bring his kindness into that situation in your life. He wants to show you his kindness, but he also wants you to show his kindness to others. And that's really what we're going to talk about in this incredible story. Uh, Mephibosheth, we're going to learn how to receive God's kindness but we're also gonna learn how to give it. And there's kind of like four things I want you to write down through this of how can we do this. And so I believe this, I believe the better gifts of Christmas are unexpected. They're, they're the unexpected gift. And so in, in Mephibosheth, in his life, his instincts were to run, but he couldn't run. And so David calls him forward. And I just know this is like the, the story of our life. When, when we have three boys, um, and when they were younger, if we'd be like, they were like really bad at like a, at someone's house we went to, if we ever went to your house and our kids were bad, I'm sorry about that, but we did correct them. We go home, we say, when we get home, we're going to talk to you about this. And that talking is going to be more than talking. Like, we're going you know, to deal. There's going to be some punishment. And so we get in the car, and, like, our van has, like, these auto lock doors. I right? just hit them, and, and so as soon as we pull in, it's like, and they're, like, gone. They're, like, you know, I'm hiding. They're going to run and hide, and all of a sudden we're, like, looking for them, and, like, then their feet are, like, sticking out of the closet, because like, they're like, like, we found you. And they're like, no, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. You know, whatever that, that's the way it goes down. Like, I didn't mean it for it to happen. <laughs> but our natural instinct is like Mephibosheth, it's to run. And in this moment, he's called forward and he can't run. And I, I, this is incredible. Uh, Leda Bar, it actually means the house of no bread. And if you know anything about David, he's from Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And so there's this incredible story that's going on here. And here's David, the, the, the man from the place called the House of Bread, and he's looking for the son of shame from the House of No Bread. This is his story that he has. And so David summons him in, and imagine that moment. This poor, crippled man comes before him. He's helpless. He can't flee. He can't run. And honestly, the true problem he had wasn't with his physical state, you know, is a problem. It was an internal problem. It was the literal blood that flowed through his body because he carried Saul's blood. The literal problem. The very blood in his veins made him the enemy of David. And Mephibosheth, he knew what was coming his way. And so in verse six, it says this, when he came to David, this is what he did. He bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. He's begging for his life. That's what's really taking place here. And he says, I'm your servant. Well, here's the problem. Can he serve? No. He can't serve. 
So he's standing in there, and here's David. He's the judge, the juror, the executioner, and something unexpected happens. We love the unexpected. The better gifts of Christmas are always the unexpected ones. And, and David says, don't be afraid. David said, I intend to show you kindness. You know, I love the unexpected. I love when you, when you think the worst is going to happen, but the best happens. You know, it's that time of the year, a Christmas story is going to be running nonstop from here on out this whole week, right? How many of you guys like a Christmas story? I mean, every year you got to watch it. How many like the movie A Christmas Story? Grinches across this place. What in the world? So he says this way. The only thing he wants is this Red Ryder BB gun, right? I'll shoot your eye out. You know, like, you will shoot your eye. He'll get, so and they open up all Christmas. And, you, you know, if you've seen the movie, if you haven't, you should watch it. Just, you know, it's just, just Christmas. And, and all the stuff is gone. And then tucked behind the desk at the very end, there it is. And he's ecstatic because the best gifts are the unexpected. He doesn't think he's going to get it. And I, I just want to tell you, as you begin to walk through this Christmas season, for one thing, receive the unexpected gift that God wants to give to your life. But give. Move into someone's life this season and move in an unexpected way. That when you show up to their door, they go, I can't believe you're here. I can't believe. You don't know the need you just met in my life. You, you have no idea what you're doing in my life. I just believe that, that the better gifts of Christmas are unexpected. The second one is this, the better gifts of Christmas are undeserved. And so verse seven says this, don't be afraid, David said, I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. So catch this, so David's wrath should have burned against him because he's the grandson of Saul, but it was quenched because of his friendship with Jonathan. I want you to put this on the, on the screen and I want you to get, the blood of Jonathan was more powerful than the blood of Saul in the eyes of David. Now, if you know where I'm going with this, you've been around church a little bit. The wrath of God is burning against you and I. And we are this person. We are walking in this. We are Mephibosheth. And we look at this place, and God's wrath should be burning against us because it says that we have the blood of our father, Adam, that runs through us. And Adam sinned against God, and he brought us under the curse. But like David's love for Jonathan, it extended to his son. Well, I want to tell you, our heavenly father's love for his son, Jesus, moves greater. Listen to this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Not really a Christmas verse, but it's a great verse. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Hey, if you want the better gift of Christmas this season, the, the best gift you can give and get is just receiving Jesus and passing Jesus on to others. It, it, it's the greatest thing you can take in this season, and it was undeserved favor. And that's really what the Christmas story is all about, is Jesus sending his one and only, his beloved, his son, not because we deserved it, but because we didn't deserve it. We were under a curse, and he said, I want to show God's kindness to you. And so he sent his one and only son. Number three is this, the better gifts of Christmas are over the top. Don't we love over the top gifts? Oh, over the top. The second part of, uh, of seven just says, I'll, I'll give you all the property. Listen to what David does. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. This is over the top. A man that deserves death has now been invited into the king's table, and he says, you know what else I'm going to do? All the land your grandfather owned, I'm giving it back to you. It's yours. The king's house became his house. Restoration. He dwelt with David. He was accepted into David's presence. This is what his response says. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and explained, who is your servant that you should show, show such kindness to a dead dog like me, this is like our natural instinct. How many of you guys have just been blessed before? You've just been blessed. And our natural reaction is to go, no, 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 no. I can't, I can't take that. Like, I can't. How am I supposed to receive that? That's our, our human flesh does that. And God's trying to paint a picture here for us that he wants us to receive his unmerited, over-the-top kindness so that we can pass his kindness on to others. We've all been in that place. You feel unworthy. We have to receive. We have to learn to receive these over-the-top gifts. So the story goes on. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, 
I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons, your servants, are to farm the land, produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, he will eat here at my table. Over the top. Ziba replied, yes, said the Lord, the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own, what? Say it with me. Son. He was an enemy of David, but he was now brought into his family. He wasn't made a servant. He was made a son. And you and I are offered the exact same invitation from God. He's looking at us, he goes, I want to show kindness on you. Not because of merit, not because of standing, not because of our own good, not because of our own righteousness, but because he grafted us into the bloodline of Jesus. John 1, 12 says this, but, all, but to all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become what? The children of God. Romans 8, 17 says it like this, and since we are his children, we are his heirs, In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs in God's glory. Can we stop this Christmas season and just thank the Lord for just a minute? Come on, we just thank you, Lord, for your your kindness that you showed us. We are children of God. It's our privilege to, to now dwell at the king's table for now and forever. It's over the, the top. And here's my last thought for you here, the this morning, the better gifts of Christmas, they can never be repaid. They can never be repaid. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and from, from then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants, and Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem, and he, he regularly ate at the king's table. Now, the author tells us this important detail, and it's for a reason. He books it, he bookends the story to make sure that we know he's still crippled. Why is that? Because it was so important to the story that he couldn't do anything to earn or deserve the place at this table. He didn't get better and said, okay, now that I'm back, I'm walking around, now I'm serving the king, now I'm doing this. He was accepted just as he was. Just the exact place that that he was. He bookends his story. He never recovered. He was disabled. He never worked to earn his spot. Because some of us, this is our thought. We get saved, and then we think we have to keep earning it. We have to keep working towards it. We have to keep on getting ourselves to the place to be at the king's table. And he's saying, I took you as you were. You're welcome to my table. You you are my son. You are my daughter. You are heirs in this. And so today, receive the better gift of God's kindness. Amen? I want you to receive it. And, and, And then as you receive it, we are to be carriers of the same kindness that we received and give it to others. During this Christmas season, I want to encourage every single person in this room to be kind to one another. And I'm not talking about giving up your parking spot at the mall, even though that's a good start. (laughs) And if I pull in, let me have the spot. No, I'm just kidding. That's a good thing to do. But I think this goes way beyond that. I think it goes way, way deeper into showing God's kindness, not your kindness. Your kindness is only going to get so far. You with me? We have kindness to offer, but it's never going to be life transforming. But when we offer God's kindness, hearts are changed, lives are changed. And there's only one way we can show this kind of kindness, and that's for us to receive it first. Romans 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What do you say? Give it all to him. Live your life every day in service to the Lord. Receive the gift of this radical kindness and give it to others. I want to close my thoughts, and I want to just pose two questions to you. I pose them to myself. I pose them to our family. In view of God's radical, over-the-top, can't-pay-back kindness, Here's for you. Who are you seeking out to show God's over-the-top kindness? Who are you going to seek out this Christmas season? Who are you going to seek out beyond this Christmas season and show over-the-top kindness? 
Who do you know that's hiding? Down and out, the downtrodden, the broken. And David says, is there anybody out there? And Saul's family, I can show God's kindness to. I want you to think about the people that the Lord has brought in and around your life. He says, is there anybody I can show God's kindness to? Do I know anybody right now that's hurting? Probably. Do I know anyone that's probably gone through a difficult situation? Probably. Do I know anybody that's sick? Do I know anyone that's walking through something? I do. And here's what I want to do. I want to show them over the top kindness. I want to show them God's kindness. Here's the second question. Are you making room for people at God's table without stipulations? Are you making room for people at your table without stipulations? Remember, none of us belong to that table, but by God's grace, his kindness, his mercy. This would be a great week. We're going to have a great Christmas Eve service. Why don't you invite somebody this week to an invitation to be a part of God's table? Amen? Relationship with him. We can't repay what God's done for us, but we can be ambassadors of it. Psalm 23 says this. I love this scripture. And if even this is your first time in church, you've probably heard this. It says, even though I walk through the valleys of shadow or death, I'm not going to fear evil because he leads me where? Into green pastures. And I were like, that sounds, that sounds great. And he anoints my head with oil. And that sounds great. And his, his staff and his rod, they protect me. And then there's this little part. And it goes, and he prepares a feast for me. In what? The presence of my enemies. Whoa. And I always step back and I go, ooh, up to that point, this felt really good. I was, I was liking the oil. I, I was liking the staff and the rod. And I was loving the green pastures. Sounds like a spa day. But now you're preparing a feast and I got to sit with my enemies? Hmm. I want to ask you like a really challenging question this Christmas season. Are you willing to invite your enemies to your table? There's better gifts to give to Christmas. And you say, Pastor John, you have no idea what they've done to me. You have no idea what they've said to me. You have no idea how they hurt me. You have no idea the words that have been said. You have no idea the actions that have been done against me. And I'm saying, I don't know, but God does. And I'm not asking you to show your kindness this season. I'm asking you to show God's kindness. Are you really ready to give the better gifts of Christmas this season? And it's unmerited over the top, un, you, you're not going to get anything back. No merit. I say, God, I've been walking through a fence for way too long. And I've been angry at that person for way too long. And I got this family member, I got this aunt, I got this sister, I got this brother, I got this coworker, I got this boss, I got this stuff going on. And I've been walking around with this way too long. And this Christmas season, I'm going to give away a better gift. I'm going to give away God's kindness. And I'm going to forgive. And I'm going to not only forgive, I'm going to invite them. Not because they deserve it, but because God loves them. To the table. It's a tough word. But I promise you, it'll change your life. Amen? Let's all stand up together. I want to pray for you today. All across this room, I'm going to ask you just to take a moment. I want you just to meet with the presence of the Lord. You need to pray a prayer that I can't pray for you. It's going to be between you and the Lord, and it's going to say, God, who are you, showing, who are you calling for me to show God's kindness to? Is it a better gift i got to give? And it's just asking you, who can I give it to? Most of you, you know immediately who it is. The Lord's already dropped them in your heart and your mind. It's going to be a difficult phone call this week. And if they don't receive it, here's what I want to tell you. It's okay. You're going to show God's kindness with nothing in return. You're going to walk by the co-worker's office this week and say, hey, can we talk? And you're going to move into a relationship and invite them to the table of relationship and life. If you want to give the better gifts this season, if you want to give, if you want to give the power of God wrapped in 
prayer, you should do that. And if you want to give the love of God wrapped in serving, you should serve somebody. And if you want to bring healing, give words of life. And if you want to see relationships restored, give God's kindness away this season and beyond. Would you make a motion towards the Holy Spirit, towards the Lord today? I, I, whatever you feel comfortable with. For us that have been around church for a long time, we just stick our hands in the air and we just say, I surrender to you. And if you're new today, that might feel really awkward. Maybe it's just a little subtle motion to just putting your hand on your heart and say, God, I sense your presence and you're speaking to me. I, I want to move out into better realms of relationships with those around me. I want to love you with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And I want to love my neighbor greater than I love myself. I want to move into the words that you've called me to do. And I want to release God's kindness all over this earth. We want to see revival, church. We're going to show God's kindness. I promise you. We want to see a move of God. It's going to be because of his kindness. It's not going to be because of anger. It's not going to be because of hostility. It's going to be because of his kindness released the same way he released it to you. You released it to others. If you need to receive the love of God in this moment, just put yourself in a receptive spirit. He's t I want you to know, some of you come in here and your initial thought is just like our story. No, 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 no. I'm just a dog. I can't receive that. I'm just a I just want to tell you the Lord doesn't see you that way. He wants to pour out his love across this room. I'm going to ask every person to bow your head, your heart, close your eyes. Anybody here today, and I'm just going to ask you when I ask this, if you just shoot your hand up in the air, that the best gift you can receive this Christmas season is a personal relationship with Jesus. If you've never had the opportunity to accept Christ as your personal Savior, God sent his son, Jesus, to show his kindness to you. He died on a cross to forgive your sins. He doesn't want anything back. You can't return that. He just says, you commit your life to me. You'll have eternity in heaven. Maybe you have to say that prayer. Maybe you said that prayer a long time ago, but this Christmas season you want to rededicate your life. If that's you, just shoot your hand in the air. I'm not going to embarrass you, call you out. We had a couple people on our first. I see your hand. You can put it right back down. Anybody else? Shoot it up a little bit higher so I see who it is. I see your hand. You can put it back down. I see your hand. You can put it back down. Anybody else? Anybody else? You accept the Lord. I see your hand in the back. You can put it back down. Amen. I see your hands up front here. You guys can put it right back down. Amen. I'm going to pray a prayer, a prayer. We're going to come in community with those who raise their hands, and we're just going to say, we pray this prayer with you. The Bible says, if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth that he's Lord, that we're saved. It's no special prayer, but we're going to pray that prayer. And you're going to have the greatest gift of Christmas poured into your life. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you sent your son for me. And he died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. And this morning, I received that forgiveness. And because of that, I give you my life. You are my Lord. You are my King. I surrender it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give those just a big round of applause. We're so thankful for what the Lord is doing. Can't wait for Christmas Eve services. We're going to wrap up our series, and we kind of talked about what kind of gifts, talked about the who's we can give, and uh, looking forward to talking to you about the when's. We're going to talk about unwrapping divine moments on Christmas Eve. The Lord's got a great word for us. And store. Can I pray a prayer of blessing on every single person uh, across this place? I just want to tell you, it's so great to be with you today. Thank you for your love, your appreciation. We feel appreciated every day. We're, we so we feel so blessed for the opportunity to lead this wonderful congregation. So thankful for our pastoral staff. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful. I just pray a prayer of blessing on every single person. I pray this week, as we get closer to Christmas, that we would come closer to Christ. You would draw our hearts closer to you every single day, Lord. We, wanna, we want our relationship with you to grow stronger and greater in every single capacity. We love you. We thank you. We commit it to you. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Amen. Hey, have a great day. God bless you. Amen.